Welcome to New Scandinavian Cooking from Buskerud in Norway. I'm Andreas Wiestad. It was here on the thousands of mountain farms and summer pastures that the Norwegian national identity was formed, shaped by the contradiction between too much, the abundance of summer, and not enough, the hardships of winter. And in today's program, we'll focus on the conservation techniques that were invented to be able to survive winter and which, quite incidentally, also made food much more interesting and much better. And in today's program, I'll make one of the most peculiar delicacies in world cuisine, namely the fermented fish, rakfisk. And I'll also make a much more accessible version of this, a sort of gravlax, only with trout, that can be made in less than half an hour. And for main course, we'll have smoked and salted lamb shanks from some of the happiest animals I know, served with an entire family of root vegetables. I'll start off by doing what dairy mates have always done, giving fresh milk, a longer and more interesting life by turning it into yogurt and cheese. Have you ever tasted fresh milk? I mean, have you ever tasted really fresh milk? It's something quite different. It is sweet and it's aromatic and it's delicious and I don't drink much milk normally, but this I could drink every day. I need a little goat milk, but I sense a little reluctance. Elegance in all your movements and manners is the key to successful goat husbandry, as you can see. These goats are still roaming freely with their kids, and they're not very happy that I milk them. Well, I'm sure at least I got a few drops out of it. In homeopathic medicine, it said that if you have one millionth of a component, it's still active. And I think I'm slightly above that. Milk like this, unpasteurized, unhomogenized, straight from the cow, is a luxury that can't even be bought for money. You've got to own a cow or know a farmer to get milk like this. And the interesting thing is that in this, you can actually not only taste milk, but you can taste the area here, the pasture lands. It tastes of what the cows eat and how they live. So milk from another valley or from another part of the country will taste different. And I'm gonna conserve it. I'm gonna make yogurt from it, and then I'm gonna make a cheese. And it's a very simple process that can also be followed at home. Here I've got three liters of milk. That's about three quarts of milk. And to this, I'm going to add a little bit of a yogurt starter culture. That sounds like something that you will get in a specialty store, but any yogurt is a starter culture. So um, if you just buy a uh, plain yogurt, Greek style, Bulgarian style, and then you just add it to the milk. And I'm just stirring this in and then gently heating until it's 37 degrees Celsius, 98 Fahrenheit. And the next day, this is how it looks. This skin is because the milk was not homogenized, so the fat tends to collect on top. 
that is not going to happen if you use normal store-bought milk but the texture will be more or less the same here you see it's got a kind of jello-like consistency and it is incredibly fresh tasting and it's lovely to eat for breakfast but I'm going to use this to make cheese and today I'm going to make two different types of cheese one cheese that I'm going to store for quite a long time and then eat it sometime this fall or this winter and then I'm going to make a much uh, quicker version as well that will only take me a day but here I take seven and a half deciliters three cups of yogurt and if you haven't bothered to make your own yogurt you can just make store-bought Bulgarian style or Greek style yogurt just place it in the cheese cloth tie it with a string and hang it the second cheese I'm going to make is a fresh cheese that will only take two days to make and it's going to be packed with flavor I'm going to flavor it with thyme and mint The string as well. I hope my dentist isn't watching. Now both of the cheeses are going to hang for about 24 hours. It is a good idea not to hang them outside in the sun. Do hang them a shady place, somewhat cooler than room temperature but preferably somewhat warmer than normal refrigerator temperature. After 24 hours I place the cheeses in salt water that's water with about six to eight percent salt and I'll leave them for another 24 hours and this is how the small cheese looks now you see it has firmed up very nicely isn't it beautiful well it will need some more ripening so I've just put a sprig of rosemary and I'm going to add a little bit of salt and then just carefully place the cheese inside and I just press the cheese ever so slightly and then I'll add a little more rosemary just for flavor a little more salt close it up I'm going to store it in my cheese cupboard until winter. You could store it in your refrigerator as well, but the warmest zone in your fridge. The second cheese, the fresh cheese, is really finished now. It's ready to eat and you see it's got quite soft texture, but still quite firm. And if you wanted it harder, you could just hang it a little bit longer. But since this is not a particularly fatty cheese, I think it's nice when it's still quite creamy and you can eat it with a spoon. Mm. And the flavor is fabulous. It's got some of the freshness of the yogurt and then the herby flavor as well, the flavor of the mint and the thyme. And I think it's lovely. You can serve it just like this or with olive oil or here we got some cold pressed rapeseed oil it's kind of like the olive oil of the north and this is a truly kind of Mediterranean dish but seeing only very Scandinavian ingredients you can find all the recipes at our website newscancook.com
the summer mountain pastures was different from normal 19th century life. It was a woman's world. The women governed. They made butter and cheese, which was both an important addition to the family economy and food for the household. The men, on the other end, looked after the farm back home. They harvested and stored hay. In other words, they did all the boring stuff. But when autumn came, they would fish, hunt, cure meat, smoke fish, and make the infamous rakfisk, the fermented trout. Originally, rakfisk was made by burying fish in the ground, like Jan Birger Furuset demonstrates. However, this is no longer how we do it, apart from a few daredevils who will risk anything for an authentic rakfisk experience. One of the most important things when you're making fermented trout is that you've got to be really careful about the hygiene. You've got to make sure to clean the fish thoroughly to remove all traces of blood. And there's nothing cleaner than this melt water coming down from the mountains. Then it's time to salt the fish. And the secret number for salting is five and a half. Five and a half percent salt according to the weight of the fish. The fish is placed in layers in a bucket. And when the bucket is full, a weight is placed on top and then it's left for four to five days. After that, it's covered with lightly salted water and then it can be left in a cool place to ferment for a long time until winter is here. Winter used to be a time of hibernation. Now it's the most active time up here. Lots of people, lots of activities, and townspeople come here to experience the winters that country folk have always dreaded this time of year when everything is covered with icy cold snow. Until about a hundred years ago, much of community life in winter was dependent on skis. Skis were used for transport and hunting. They were practical in a sparsely populated country where distances were great and the terrain difficult. And as we've seen, these old traditions of conserving food are still important in this region. I like the way they taste but also the way they connect us to our past. Alpine skiing has gradually increased in popularity in Norway. Here in Jailo, you'll find a wide range of slopes and terrain parks for snowboarding, and new talents surface constantly. collection of words of Norwegian origin have made their way into the English language. Bag is one of them, ombudsman is another, 
and slalom is the third and perhaps the most relevant here today. And slalom consists of sla, which basically just means a slope, and lum, which means a track. Hemseldal is a ski sport center. It's been referred to as the Scandinavian Alps and in many ways it's true except you don't need to know how to speak French. The latest innovation is to have children's play slopes. It used to be said that Norwegians were born with skis on their feet. This is no longer true I'm afraid and there has to be some sort of grand plan if Norway is going to continue being a skiing nation. The idea is that at these sites, children should be able to learn the basic skills of skiing at a very early age, and of course, to have fun while learning them. They say that the proof of the pudding is in the eating. Well, when it comes to rak fisk, the fermented trout, the proof of the rak fisk is really in the smelling. It is pretty intense after all this time of fermentation. It's a bit like that kind of unpleasant pleasantness of walking into a cheese shop in France. But I think the great thing about Rockfisk is that, much like French cheese, while, while the smell is intense, the flavour is quite mild and subtle. And the texture now is soft, almost velvety. And the typical way of serving Rockfisk is on traditional flatbread with a little bit of onion and then a dollop of sour cream. Mm. It is amazing because you can still sense that thing that makes it really smell quite powerful, but, but, but still it has a mildness uh, and and almost a kind of sweetness to it. And you understand that it's made from a fish, but it's unlike any other fish you've had. Although rock fisk is one of the most, some would say extreme, some would say peculiar food traditions, it does have some relatives that are not quite as hardcore. The most important perhaps is gravlax. And you may know gravlax, it's a kind of uh, cured salmon uh, and that is cured with salt and sugar. And it, normally it's cured for, for like uh, three to four days. Well, I'm gonna show you a version where you can actually make a kind of gravlax in just 20 minutes or so. And the secret then is to cut the fish into thin slices. In this case, I'm using trout. Julia Child used to live in Norway in the 1950s. One of the things that she really fell in love with was gravlax, and she also developed this easy way to make a kind of quick gravlax. I've got here a combination of salt and sugar, and then I add about half a teaspoon of dried dill, and I just sprinkle this mixture on a plate and then add thin slices of trout and then I sprinkle the rest of the salt and sugar mixture on top 
And what Julia Child would always do was add a couple of tablespoons of brandy or cognac or even aquavit when she made Gravlax. Uh, I've added some cognac to this and I'm just spraying it over just enough to add a little bit of moisture and start the curing process. I actually like it best when it's cured for a relatively short period of time, say 20 minutes, half an hour. It's said that cheese is milk seeking immortality. These are a couple of the cheeses made from the ladies here down in the valley. But what I'm really excited about is my own cheese. It's now a couple of months old and it's starting to firm up and it smells fantastic. And I'm saying that partly because I made it myself, even if it doesn't qualify me as a kind of master cheese maker. Now it's been about 20 minutes and the you can see that the texture is changed. The fish is somewhat firmer and there's an excess of water here. That's water that has been drawn out by the salt and the sugar. And you can use this in, in a salad. It's wonderful with something tart like apples and, and uh, a salad with a bit of bite in it, like uh, arugula. But I think that it's very nice with a traditional way of serving it as well on dark rye bread with coarse grain mustard like this and then just a small sprig of fresh dill because as I normally say when it comes to dill I'm absolutely insatiable. You can find all the recipes at our website newsgangcook.com but all this is nibble nibble food and man's got to eat so I've already started with the main course, which is smoked lamb shanks with root vegetables. Lamb shank is like the lower part of the leg of the lamb. The upper part of the thigh was normally eaten sometime during autumn, but the shank is a different cut and is very easy to preserve. So a good way is to smoke it and salt it a little bit, and then you can just hang it up and it will keep for a very long time. Well, these are quite fresh lamb shanks but we still salt and smoke them basically for flavor so i just transfer the lamb shanks the root vegetables that i've used is celery ac, parsnip carrots rutabaga or swede and then some of these small and very sweet almond potatoes and i've cooked it in about a bottle of beer the rest is just the stock that comes that's released from the lamb shanks them themselves. And then I just make a puree out of it. And because I used uh, salted lamb shanks, then I don't need to add extra salt. If you're using fresh ones, you might need to add a bit of salt. Lamb shank can be a very, very tough cut of meat, but when it's cooked for a long time like now, it's really fall apart tender. I'm gonna serve it with a little bit of rowan berry jelly. You could use red currant jelly or port wine jelly. The best thing is to use something that has a bit of a bite to it. So if you can find anything with cranberries, uh, then that would be perfect as well. But this is it in all its glory and simplicity. about Scandinavian destinations and food, visit our website, newscancook.com.